Story 1. Every year, my boyfriend, 21 male, and I, 22 female, go on a break because he doesn't know what he wants. My boyfriend and I have been together for five years. We've always been great together. <laughs> And no one else in the world I'd rather be with. We make each other laugh. We like the same things. We have our own hobbies so we don't drive each other crazy. And we've been through so much as a couple. I am in graduate school, a state away from him, about a four-hour drive. We went a long distance fairly easily, so it blindsided me when he suddenly told me he didn't know if our relationship was what he wanted. He's always struggled with a fear of commitment, something I've tried to support him through by trying not to pressure him into moving forward. The problem is that every year for the last three years he's gone through a struggle with wanting to be with me. He wants to take a break from our relationship and be separate for a while, which I've agreed to for the last two years. Every year so far, he's come back to me saying he was being stupid and that he regrets ever being on a break. We talk things through and move forward. I thought after last year we'd be done with it, but today he gave me the same speech he's always giving about wanting a break and wanting space. I put us on the break this time because I didn't want to beg him to stay with me. I'm blindsided by this whole thing and I'm so confused about where it comes from. We're so great for 90% of the year and then the end of March comes around and he freaks out and wants to break up with me. He says he loves me and always will but doesn't know what he wants. If he comes back again, do I take him back? I don't know what to do. So I mean, first off, the two of you have been together since you were 16 and so I'm gonna say you've been each other's only serious relationship. Um, maybe you kind of dated some other people before that, but I'm sure you can agree that as you kind of get into your 20s, like, that is your only really truly serious relationship. And he's probably got some fears about that and wondering what he's missing out on and stuff. That, that happens. And that kind of stuff and, like, taking a break doesn't have to be the end of a relationship. I've known people who took a break and afterwards were stronger for it. Taking a break every year, three years in a row, that's concerning. That tells me that this person really doesn't know what he wants and maybe should date other people and stuff. And maybe the relationship isn't that great. I'm sorry, that's why I laughed when I first read it and I left it in because you can't start a post by saying, we take a break every year. We're so great together. Like, I think you need to do some real figuring out. And maybe, maybe this time when he comes crawling back, you don't take him back right away. You say, no, we're going to have a longer break until you actually figure this out. And we do some real talking. Story two. Boss wants to cut off all employees and workers from their email access over the weekend, but doesn't understand the consequences. Hello everyone, this is my first post here and I wanted to share my greatest work story. My native language isn't English, so please excuse when my grammar is a bit simple. The story starts with me and my company. I'm a 30-year-old businesswoman who works in an IT service in a bank space. I'm the girl for everything, basically, but I'm a specialist for first-level support, administration and backup, sometimes even networking. Even when I'm not head of my IT department, I basically had all the responsibilities of them, but unfortunately my pay grade doesn't reflect that at all. I think of my boss of my IT department as kind of lazy, if not incompetent. He even brags about getting so much money for basically doing nothing. I have a 40 hour work week, but since the whole damn IT department is my responsibility, I need to keep track of the servers and maybe problems that can occur 24 seven. This is mostly done via emails. When the server status gives out a warning or a failure, I will get notified and then I'm fixing the problems over a remote desktop or going to the company itself, even in my free time. I wouldn't mind this, but I'm not getting paid for this. But on the other hand, I'm getting punished when something is going wrong. My boss's boss wasn't that much better. Since it was a fancy bank, everyone should be in a suit the whole time to let it look professional, best with a skirt and high heels. Only problem is, when you work in the first level support, you need to do a lot of behind the scenes work, like slipping under the desk to do or repair cable management, doing work on the server rack, and doing lots of other activities that make you dirty. You can imagine that this wore out my business clothes really, really fast, and not only that, they were so impractical and really made my work harder. So I changed my clothes to a comfy hoodie and work pants to fit the work I'm doing a bit better. When my boss saw me, he was furious, demanding I can't look like a poor hobo inside his bank. I told him that I demand work clothes for both occasions because they are expensive and get worn out quickly. 
He refused, and I wasn't really happy about this. So this, so much for the introduction. One day, my boss's boss, the head of the whole company, called me. He had a plan. He wanted to create quiet hours, meaning he didn't want his employees working on weekends to let them rest properly. At first glance, you could say, hey, that's a nice idea. Yeah, no, he just didn't like to pay them for overwork because he got in some legal trouble with overwork paying in general. Not only that, some employees have strict deadlines and need the extra time to get work done. To actively ensure nobody can work over the weekend, he wanted the following. Please make sure no one can access their emails and remote desktop over the weekend. No exceptions. Since we had a ticket system and were able to attach emails to tickets, I asked him to write an official work task. This has two reasons. First, I like everything documented. Second, I have something to protect and secure myself if the task I was given is incorrect. And it's exactly this that saved me. So I was at my office desk again, thinking how to get the task done and what implications it would have, and then it was clear to me what it meant. The email came from my boss with the task, and indeed he wrote, for everyone, no exceptions. I was thinking to myself, should I write them the implications it would have? After thinking, I thought of how I'm treated as a worker and I decided against it. I was working immediately at this task and made an automated process to block every access to emails after Friday 6 p.m. to Monday 6 a.m. Weekend came and it was Saturday and I was calm and relaxed because if you've not noticed by now, by cutting down everyone's emails means, of course, that I don't receive any updates on the server. I can't possibly work on it because my remote access is also cut, of course. If you think you could forward your work address to your private address, no, I can't because we have a very strict data protection. Nothing is allowed to go out. I'm happy. It's still Saturday in the middle of the day. I'm cooking myself and my husband a nice meal and my telephone rings. It's my boss's boss. He talks with a stressed voice and told me that he can't access his emails. I needed a second to process this, but I responded, that doesn't surprise me at all since you ordered me to cut everyone's email access without exception. He was angry, very angry, and told me that this obviously doesn't count for him. I told him that he specifically told me that there are no exceptions, and he stated, everyone. He then argued that this wasn't how he phrased it, so I reread his own email. After that, he was silent for a moment. He noticed a flaw in his logic. I broke the silence and asked him, Sir, if you still want access to your emails on the weekend, that's no problem. Please send me a request per email, and I work on the first thing on Monday. A bit angry again, he replied that he wanted to have it done immediately, and I calmly explained to him that I can't do this, since my remote access is also blocked, like he ordered. He hung up. Ten minutes later, he called me again. He asked me calmly if I can fix the problem right now when he pays me for my overwork. He also wants me to be available at any time. It means I should have received my emails and be able to work remotely, and that this will raise my pay grade by a lot. I thought that this is the perfect opportunity. I agree to that condition and pay raise, but only when my coworkers and I finally get work clothes. He agreed. Since then, my work situation drastically improved, and mostly only because I maliciously complied, well aware of the consequences of the given task. <sighs> Never, ever pass up the opportunity to maliciously comply when you have bad bosses. When you have people that aren't giving you what you deserve. You deserve to be paid a fair wage and to have a comfortable work environment and not deal with nonsense. And if they're going to give you nonsense, then just give them nonsense in return, but the kind of nonsense that they can't get you for. Now I know some of you are going to say, look, I can maliciously imply and my boss could still just fire me and stuff. Yeah, they could. And if that's the case, I am very, very sorry. Don't put your job at risk if you don't have to or you don't have something else lined up. But also, if you're in that kind of situation, please start looking for a different job and abandon these awful companies and their terrible practices, if at all possible. Story 3. Delay my home purchase? Fine. Sell for less than asking price to someone else. Three years ago, I moved from the East Coast to, to California. I was fortunate to be moving from a city that was very expensive, super touristy and popular with boomer retirees, so I was able to sell my home for way more than I paid for it. Otherwise, a move to Cali? No way. This place is expensive, even the Inland Empire where I was buying a home. 
My spouse, now ex, and I were working with a fabulous realtor and found several great homes in our price range. Unfortunately, at the beginning of 2021, the city we were looking in was hot. Every time we made an offer, we were outbid. It was frustrating. However, there was one house that was sitting on the market for a while that my spouse loved. It had some issues, but it was under $300,000 under our max budget so we could deal with them. I wasn't in love with it, but she was pushing hard for it, so we put in an offer for the house and some of the contents, also for sale, about $10,000 over asking price. Weeks go by. The realtor representing the seller, Mr. DeLay, is asking for proof that we can afford the home. Um, okay, provided. He wants to know what my job is. Executive. Oh, really? On and on and on. Keep suggesting that they might get a better offer. Continually suggests we can't afford a home this nice. Finally, I'm done. A different house that I really wanted falls out of escrow. It's listed for about $110,000 more than the house we're trying to buy from Mr. DeLay. I offer $55,000 over asking price, contingent on appraisal, duh, get that house under contract, and my realtor tells Mr. DeLay to pound sand. Mr. DeLay crapped his pants, blew up my realtor's phone, no, 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 we'll, we'll take your offer, please reconsider. Nope, my realtor was busting up laughing. She said he was a sexist douche and she loved seeing him squirm. That house ended up selling for $10,000 under asking. I wonder how he explained that to his woman client. <sighs> I understand the necessity for realtors to like help navigate selling houses because honestly you start asking about like escrow and contingent on appraisal, duh. Like, I don't know. I don't know what that stuff means, and I don't want to have to learn. I want to hire a professional to take care of that stuff. But my god, when they get so ridiculously money hungry, and they're trying to like play these mind games, and they're sexist douchebags and stuff, it just makes me never want to deal with that stuff. Can't we just, can't we just like, you know, here, here's a hundred dollars and a couple fatted calves and stuff for you, and I'll take this land and grow wheat on it or something. I don't know what they did in olden times, but it has to be better than what we're dealing with now. Story 4. An Attorney's Dream Case. My Parents versus The Bank. In 1973, my parents had enough money to build a little ranch house in the country. The small bank in town approved the mortgage, and the bank signed a contract to give Bob the money to build the house. Bob, as it turns out, was overbooking himself all over town, leaving his clueless minions to do the actual work. The bill took longer and longer, with more and more work having to be ripped out and redone. We're not talking about using the wrong color paint or nails up some wonky trim here. The architect forgot to fully erase a line on the blueprints, and the framers built a wall through the bathtub. My mother was told, don't put anything heavy in the kitchen cabinets because they were attached to the drywall, not the studs, using a few roofing nails through the back of each cabinet. The garage door opening was framed into the living room instead of towards the driveway, and so on. Oops. When the bank's representative showed up for the final inspection, my parents met him in the front yard and refused to sign off on Bob's work. Then the representative became angry as the bank had paid Bob a lot of money. He strode to the front door and pulled on the doorknob, whereupon the entire door, casing included, fell on him. It had simply been wedged, not nailed, into place. The bank called Bob, who finally showed up to supervise the work himself. The only problem was that Bob wasn't any better at building a house than his minions were. My parents still refused to sign off on the house. My mother was a stay-at-home mom in a nasty rental with two tiny children while my dad was working two jobs while this was going on. Throughout the entire process, the bank and Bob treated them very poorly, bullying my mom and lying to my dad. What should have been an exciting time for my parents was ruined. My mom cried a lot, my dad got depressed. Finally, the bank threatened my parents with foreclosure, and Bob threatened to sue my parents for breach of contract because the bank refused to pay him any more money. So, my exhausted parents went to an attorney and gave him the rundown. Plumbing, electrical, tiling issues, the whole sorry mess. My parents were scared. All they had was their small down payment savings, so if this became a lengthy court battle, the bank and Bob would win. The attorney, Tom, was kind, but my dad said that he could tell he and Mom were doomed from Tom's facial expression as he sorted through the paperwork. Then abruptly, Tom smiled. Let's get everyone together for a meeting, he told my parents, tomorrow. 
So my parents, Tom, the bank's representative, the bank's attorney, Bob and Bob's attorney, met at the bank. Tom didn't give anyone else time to begin. He said, well, my clients have decided that they no longer want this house. Please remove it. Everyone else starts to laugh. Remove it? Have you lost your mind? Tom, in a sweeping theatrical gesture, placed a deed on the table. My clients own the land the house is sitting on outright. They no longer want the house. Get the house off my client's land. Bob's attorney stared at the deed and then turned and stared at Bob. You built a house on land you don't own? Bob nodded. The bank's attorney started yelling at the bank's representative. You didn't finance the land the house is on? The representative stammered. Uh, no? Tom said firmly, As I said, gentlemen, you're trespassing on my client's land. I expect the house to be removed and the land returned to its original state at once. My dad said he'll remember the blank looks everyone on the other side of the table passed to one another for his whole life. Sure, the man could foreclose on a house that wouldn't exist by the end of the week with no way to recoup the money. They didn't even own the land it was on. Bob was out the 50% he'd paid out of pocket, plus he was on the hook for tearing down the house and removing it. On top of that, the bank would undoubtedly want him to repay the initial 50% they'd given him. Could they have gone after my parents? Sure, a foreclosure would have meant bad credit for my parents moving forward. They might lose their down payment. But to sign off on the house and its condition at that time would have meant thousands and thousands of dollars in cash to replace and repair everything from the roof to the basement before the house could be safely lived in. The the bank knew my parents didn't have that kind of money. They're the ones who approved the mortgage. Suddenly, my parents were good people, and it was all such a misunderstanding, and the bank and Bob couldn't do enough for them. The house was brought in line with the original blueprints and specifications immediately, at no extra cost to my parents, but at a considerable cost to Bob. My parents signed the mortgage, Bob got the rest of his money, and just about broke even on the build. The bank's representative was fired, and Tom, attorney extraordinaire, got a stinging tale of triumph to record call to fellow attorneys for the rest of his life. Before you question this tale, please remember that 1973 was 50 years ago. Banks did things differently back then. Smaller rural banks in particular were not run the same way the bigger city banks were. There were far fewer federal regulations, and in a smaller community, people didn't always follow them. Anyway, I'm pretty sure they don't always follow them now. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you right now, even nowadays with all the bigger banks, uh, banks aren't your friends. Banks want money. They're hungry for your money. Oh, you keep your money with them? They want to keep that money as much as possible. They want to make money off of your money. They want to do everything possible to take money away from you, which can often mean screwing you over. My God, keep so much paperwork. My God, be so careful when dealing with banks. Also, be careful when dealing with scuzzy contractors. Look up all the reviews you possibly can. I mean, back in 1973, there wasn't Yelp or the internet or anything, so I can't blame these folks. I'm glad it worked out for them. But for the rest of you, there are still contractors like this, especially if they're house flippers. Be careful of house flippers. Just be careful in general when dealing with anyone. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.